I don't know about you, but I had a tendency to be, well, a little bit more bonded to one of my parents than the other. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we as parents, we love our children equally, but sometimes we just tend to be a little bit more closer to one child than the other. You know what I, I'm saying? Which is why sometimes we say she's a daddy's girl or he's a mommy's boy, because we tend to form a bond with one child more than another. Now, don't get me wrong, I hunted with my dad, fished with my dad, camped with my dad, we worked on cars together, we even exercised together, but the person I was closest to growing up was actually my mom. Now, here's what I know about moms, they're not the same after they have us. Have you noticed that? I mean, your mother was a rather different person before she had you. Before she had you, she was cool. She, she, she had a life. I mean, she had things going on. Your mom was all of that before she had you. But once she had you, things began to change, and you did that to her. Now, one of the things that tends to change when a woman becomes a mom is, well, the first thing we notice is her appetite. Now, there were a group of people who got together, and they were looking at some of the cravings that women experience while they're going through pregnancy. And they put together a list of the top 10 things that women tend to crave while they're pregnant. Now, I'm not here to judge. I mean, this is just what it is, and this is what your mom went through because of you. Some women, they crave ice. Some, dirt. Again, I'm not here to judge. Um, for others, it's raw meat. For some, it was toothpaste. Uh, for some, it wasn't pickles and ice cream. It was sauerkraut and ice cream. For some, it was chalk. Uh, for some, dog biscuits. Again, I'm not here to judge. Um, jam and pickles, donuts and ranch sauce, lemons and cream cheese. Now, I actually like that last one. But do you understand? You did that to your mother. She was normal before she had you, and you did this to her. But now, that's not all. Some other things began to change. Like your mom began to lose sleep. As a matter of fact, some of your moms haven't slept since they've had you. Um, and, and, and there are times, I don't know about you, but there were times I drove my mom crazy. And, and if your mom seems a little off to you, that's because you did that to her. You drove her crazy. Now, I know when my mom had sw switched gears and she had moved into crazy mode because my mom would say things to me like, you cross me and I will kill you. I will kill you until you are dead. So apparently there's a killing not unto death. Uh, my mom would say, okay, you break your leg, don't you come running back to me. The one I loved I mean, that really confused me was, don't. Don't, don't you dare say another word. Do you hear me? Don't you dare say another word. Do you understand me? Answer me when I'm talking to you. Or my mom would look at me and say, don't you look at me in that tone of voice. And here's the thing. I did that to her. The, you see, when moms have us, it changes them and it alters them and their life is never the same. But now here's the thing. Because I had a mom who loved me and who loved Jesus, my life was never the same as well. You see, I may have given some things to my mom, but my mom gave back far much more to me. And one of the things she gave me was a much more better understanding of this Bible text. And it's a very famous Bible text. It's actually the essence of the gospel, and it is John, and it's 316. And you all know it. You can all actually repeat it with me. It's, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, Pastor Bob, I know this is a Mother's Day message, but what does John 3.16 have to do with Mother's Day? Thank you for asking. It's a great question. Well, you might notice that the first words in this begin with God loved. And that right there is your mother, because your mother loves you unconditionally. It doesn't matter how crazy you drove her. It doesn't matter how much you messed up or, or all the things you did that got on her nerves or how much you may have even, well, been rebellious. Your mother loved you unconditionally. I remember I was four years of age. And somebody had given me for my fourth birthday um, a, a toolbox filled with carpenter's tools. 
And I don't mean these were plastic tools. These were actual tools for kids. I mean, it had a flathead screwdriver. I remember there was a real hammer. And it had a real wood saw. I mean, it had a handsaw for sawing wood. One day, my mom was doing laundry. And she wasn't paying attention to me. And I was kind of a little bored. Now, as I've shared with you here at this church, I'm ADD. And when I get bored, I find creative ways to entertain myself. And this day was no different. And I thought it would be fun if I set a trap for my brother. You see, my brother and I, we shared the same room, and uh, we had a bunk bed. And he was on top, and I was on bottom. And I thought it would be funny if I sawed through the bunk bed so that when my brother got in it, it would collapse. I, I didn't say I was smart. I was crazy. So anyway... My mom's out doing the laundry. She's hanging the laundry on the line. And I made it through one pillar. And I was working on the second. And my mom walked into the room. And I tell you, when she got her hands on me, the next two years were like a blur. Actually, my mom cried. And, and don't get me wrong, there was a laying on of hands. But my mom, she cried. And the reason she cried is because we were dirt poor. You see, we were not just my brother and I in the same room, but all four of us were in the same bedroom. Uh, the bathroom was shared with another apartment, and we really could, didn't have, as they say, two nickels to rub together. We were dirt poor, and my mom could not afford to buy another bunk bed. Later that night, my mom tucked me in, and she put the bed sheets you know, up around my neck, and she kissed me on the forehead. And she said, Bobby, I love you. You see, it didn't matter how much I messed up. It didn't matter how bad I had behaved. My mom's love for me was absolutely unconditional. And we've been talking about a series called Grace Alone. And in that series, we learned that God loves you furiously. And because God loves us furiously, our value doesn't change when we sin. And the same is true with your mom. Your mom loves you unconditionally and your value, my value hadn't changed because of my bad behavior because my mom loved me furiously. And God loves you furiously. And I know right now, there's some of you out there, you've messed up. You've been sawn through the wood. You've been doing things you know you shouldn't be doing, and God still loves you furiously, and your sin has not changed your value, and because your sin has not changed your value, God is still determined to save you. And this is where the gospel begins. It begins with God is determined to save you because God so loved the world. And that's the thing we learn. As a matter of fact, God's love runs so deep. Look at this. It's Romans it's 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The first lesson I learned from my mother about the gospel of God's grace is that God loves us and he loves us unconditionally and nothing, not even your bad behavior, your sin, can separate you from the love or change the love that God has for you in Christ Jesus. And so that's the first thing we learn, is that God loved. The second thing I learned from my mother is that God gave. Now, this is mom's right there. Have you ever noticed that moms have this tendency to give and give sacrificially? As a matter of fact, all of us do this. All of us, when we love somebody, we give of ourselves sacrificially. Here at this church, we define love as the giving of yourself for the spiritual betterment of another person. In other words, I'm giving of myself to bless and benefit you. But God takes it one step further. God's love is agape love, and God loves you so much that he gives of himself to bless and benefit you when you cannot bless or benefit him back. And this was my mom. My mom gave to a fault. I remember... Now we jump ahead 10 years later. And 10 years later, my dad got saved. And, and my dad made a deal with God. My dad was a used car salesman. He made a deal with God. He said, Lord, any time I sell a car, you get 15% of the profits. And my dad started selling car 
after car after car. And my dad said, look, I gotta up this. And so he went from 15% to 20%, and my dad couldn't keep cars on his parking lot. You see, you can't outgive God, and you know what? You can't outgive your mother. So my dad, I'm 14, it's 10 years later, and my dad says to my mom, um, I'm gonna, I want to give you some money, honey, you need some clothes. Here's $400, and I want you to go out and buy yourself some clothes. My dad hated clothes shopping, so he sent my mom on, on her own. But understand, my dad's instructions were very careful, very, very determined. Buy it and spend it on yourself. Now, $400 today? I mean, you can hardly buy a winter, good winter coat for $400. I mean, if you get a good dress for four, maybe you go to Winners and you get a better deal, but you understand $400 doesn't go the same distance that it used to when we, well, back in the 70s. So my mom went out, and she's shopping for clothes. And she came back, and she's got arms, bags on her arms, and she said, David, look at everything I was able to buy. And then my mom started pouring the clothing out on the floor, and she created two piles of clothes. Do you know why my mom put it into two piles of clothes? Because one pile was for my brother, and the other pile was for me. Now, why did my mom do that? She was supposed to spend the money on herself, so why did she do it? Because my mom lived her life in such a way that she was determined to bless and benefit her children. And, and the Bible says that God gave. And what did, what did God give? Well, look at this. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Here's Paul's point. I know God loves you, and I know God is for you and not against you because of what he gave you. And what God gave you was his son, Jesus Christ. And he gave you Jesus because God is determined to bless you and benefit you when you cannot bless or benefit him back. And Paul says, I know God is for you because of the cost, the price, and the value of what God gave you. And God could have said, nope, you're on your own. You sinned, you broke your leg, don't you come running back to me. You cross me, I will kill you until you were dead. God could have done that. But instead, God responds to our sin with what we called grace. And we learned that when we, when we sin, God responds with an inexhaustible ability to forgive and to bless and to redeem. And in order to do that, God gave you, and you understand, you can't outgive God. Because God gave you the greatest thing there is in the universe. He gave you Jesus Christ. And so the second thing I learned from my mom about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that not only did God love me, but then God gave me the greatest thing he had. And it was an outpouring and the result of his love. So God loved, God gives, but now let me ask you, do you believe? Do you believe that God loves you? Take a look at this Bible passage. It's Romans 8 and 28. By the way, Romans 8 happens to be my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, here's what I know. It says, and we know, well, here's what I know. God loves you. I, without a shadow of a doubt, with absolute certainty and assurance, I can stand here and tell you today that God loves you. And I know that for an absolute fact. But there was a time in my life when I knew that God loved you. I was absolutely certain that God loved you. But what I wasn't so sure of or certain of was whether or not God loved me. And then there was a point in my life where I was, okay, well, okay, I think God loves me, but I'm fairly certain he's disappointed in me. And the reason I wasn't sure of God's love and I thought that God was so disappointed in me is because God knows the real me. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got good friends. I've got some buddies. I've got some, some bros, and man, I tell you, they know me. My wife and my kids, they know me. But God? 
He knows, knows me. I mean, God knows me better than I know myself. And I tell you, I, I know some things about me. And, and when I look at my past, and when I look at the things I used to do, I, I wasn't sure that God loved me. And, and then one day, all of that changed, and this is why I love Romans 8, because in Romans 8, chapter 1, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I love this passage because it changed the way I saw God. Because now the gospel tells me that God is into forgiving and forgetting. Look at this. It's Hebrews 8 and it's 10. And it reads, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people for I will be merciful to their iniquities. This is grace. I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And this is the Bible's way of saying, I forgive and I forget. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't forget. I know that God has forgiven my sin, and if I were to go up and talk to God about my sin, my past sin, my forgiven sin, God would go, what sin? I remember distinctly nailing that to a cross and burying it in a tomb. But I, I remember. And, and, but God comes along and he says, I will forgive it and I will forget it. And you've got to ask, why does God forgive and forget? And it's because of this. Because love does not speak into your past. Love speaks into your future. And right now what God wants to speak into your future is hope and the assurance of salvation, and the certainty of his love. God wants to speak into your life family. You are his son, you are his daughter. And God says you are above and not below. You are the head and not the tail. You are the apple of his eye. You are a royal priesthood, and you mean the world to God. God does not speak into your past sin. God speaks into your future, and what he speaks is hope faith, salvation, and love because you are a child of God and not even your sin can rob you of the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And I learned this from my mom. It didn't matter how bad I behaved. Now folks, understand that as a kid with ADD, and any of you parents out there, you, you might have a kid with ADD or autism, or something else going on in their life, and it makes raising the kid a challenge. And to, to those of you who are parents who stay by your challenging child and you love them and you hang in there and you struggle with them and you cry over them and you pray over them, understand, my mother would get you. I was a prayed-for child, but my mom would go, dear Lord, there is something wrong with that child. And I was a handful at times. And it wasn't that I was malicious, and it wasn't that I was spiteful, or that I was even devious in that sense of the word. I just got into a lot of trouble. And it doesn't, didn't matter how bad I behaved or how much trouble I got into, the one thing you could not change is my mother's love for me and her belief that one day I would make something of my life. And God comes along to you and he says, what sin? I forgave it, I'm forgetting it, now let me speak into your future. You are my child, and I have a hope for you, I have plans for you, I've got things planned for you, you couldn't even begin to imagine, because you are a child of God. And God says, when I save you, when I redeem you, I'm your dad, you're my kid, and in me there is no more condemnation. Because God is speaking into your future, and into your future, he speaks faith, hope, and love. I learned that from my mom. And when we believe, the Bible says, we receive. It's a rather famous Bible story. As a matter of fact, anybody who's read the Bible or you've heard stories about Jesus, you know this story. One day, Jesus was walking under the hot Mediterranean sun, and he, I, I imagine he was a little thirsty. And he comes across a well, and it's a very famous well because the well was dug by his great-great-great-grandfather, Jacob. 
And, and, and it's a very famous well. Uh, every Jew in, in the nation of Israel knew about this well because granddaddy Jacob, Israel himself, had dug this well. Standing at the well that day was another person. Oh, and by the way, Jacob was also her great, 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 great grandfather. So here you have cousins meeting at the well. One of them is Jesus, and another one, she's a woman. And she would have been considered the black sheep of the family. She had a reputation, especially when it came to men. And, and as she's standing at the well that day, she sees Jesus approaching, and I can imagine that she moved to the other side of the well because the last thing she needed in her life was people talking about her standing at a well next to a man who was a stranger. Because women, you didn't do that back in the day. But this wasn't just any stranger. This is a Jew. And, and, and this is the sad part in this story because they're cousins, they're family. Jacob is the great, great granddaddy of the two of them, but the two nations never got along. Kind of got a little of that going on in the Middle East right now. Family fighting. You want to break your mother's heart? Start fighting in your family. You want to break your heavenly father's heart? Start fighting in the family. And she was going to continue this family feud. And, and the reason I say that is because of how she responded to Jesus when he asked her for a little bit of water. And her response went something like this. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? Do you hear the tension? Can you feel the animosity? Can you sense the anger and the apprehension as she addresses Jesus. I mean, Jesus is asking her to give him something that actually wasn't even hers to give. I mean, it was water. It was just there for everybody. And Jacob just didn't drink, you know, drill it and dig this well for himself. It was supposed to take care of the entire family. But she didn't want to give. But the reason Jesus is asking her this question is because it's in his heart to love a woman who doesn't even trust him. Right now, it's in his heart to give something to a woman who dislikes him and hates him for no other reason than he's a Jew, and yet he is determined to love her and to save her because you can't outgive God. And look at what Jesus says to her. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You see, you can't outgive God. And what God is determined to do right now is to give you life and salvation and a hope and a future because God is your heavenly father and this is what loving parents do. They take of themselves and they pour into those whom they love even when those whom they love won't bless you back. My mom loved me that way. Now, how do I know that? Well, you see, my mom, before she met Jesus, she was a very heavy smoker. I don't, not a chain smoker, but she smoked a lot. But the moment my mom discovered she was pregnant with me, she quit smoking cold turkey. Do you know how hard that is? I mean, when you quit smoking, you go through withdrawal. Now, understand, she's pregnant with me. Uh, have you seen what pregnancy can do to a woman? The nausea, the sickness, the, the headaches, the achiness. And then add to that my mom's withdrawal. She was now experiencing uh, exponential nausea and headaches. She had the shakes. She got the moodiness. And my mom was determined to go through that and suffer through that for the sake of a child she had not yet met. Jesus Christ took a beating for you and I. He loved us before we were ever born. I mean, the reason you exist is because God called you into existence. It's why I have a problem with abortion, and I don't care what your political stance on this is. God calls people into existence. That is biblical. And God called you into existence because he loved you. And he loved you before you were even took your first breath. 
then you're here because God determined that he wanted you to exist. And, and my mom, after I was born, she cleaned me, she fed me, she played with me and she read to me and she watched over me and she protected me and she sheltered me and my mom did this my mom gave of herself to bless me benefit me and protect me when I couldn't benefit her back because you see that's what love is love is benefiting those who can't benefit you back and God says I have loved you with an everlasting love and therefore, it is with love that I call you and I draw you. And that love, that love was designed to change your future. His name is Scott Hamilton. You may know the name. He's a very famous Olympic skater. And he's a very gifted skater. What most people don't know is that growing up, Scott had an illness well, it was, I don't know the name of the illness, but it prevented him from growing at a normal rate. As a matter of fact, it, it, it affected every system in his body. And Scott spent more time in hospital than he actually did a classroom. And his mom was with him the entire step of the way. Every step of the way, his, his mom would be there by his bedside and she would clean him and, and help feed him and she would watch over him and she would read to him and she would help him with his homework and she would teach him his lessons. The entire time Scott was in hospital, his mother was there to look after him. And then one day, Scott looked up at his mom and this little boy has tears just streaming down his face. And he said, Mommy, I'm so sorry. And his mom's looking at him, and, and she's like, Scott, what are you sorry for? Like, what do you have to be sorry about? And he said, Mom, I'm so sorry. I turned out to be such a disappointment. His mom took him in her arms. And she said to him, Scott, you are not a disappointment. Scott, I love you, and I believe, I firmly believe that one day you are going to go on and do something meaningful and important with your life. And then every day she would speak love and belief into his life. Well, eventually, Scott actually literally outgrew his disease. He actually grew up and he overcame that disease. And then one day when he was a young teen, his mom dropped him off at the local skating arena. And he went inside, and there was a class going on, and kids were learning how to figure skate. And as Scott watched the kids glide and move across the ice, he thought to himself, you know what? I think I'd like to try that. And so he told his mom. His mom signed him up for lessons. And then at 5.30 every morning, his mom would get up with him, drive him down to the local arena, and Scott would practice figure skating. Scott was 19 years of age when his mom died of cancer. And she never actually got to see the man that Scott would become. Well, in 1981, his career took off. He won over the next several years 16 consecutive national and world championships. And at his first Olympics, he won a gold medal. And then all of that came to a screeching halt in 1997 when Scott had developed cancer. And he beat the cancer. But then it came back in 2010. And in 2010, this time it was more serious and it was more devastating. And on one occasion, his family pastor stopped by and he wanted to talk to Scott and his wife and the family. And the pastor just wanted to know how Scott and his family were doing. And before the pastor left, like any good pastor, he said, Scott, what can I pray for you? And Scott thought about it for a moment, and he said, you know, Pastor, my life has been so blessed. This is a kid who grew up in a hospital. And he's saying, my life has been so blessed. He says, you know what, all I want to do is thank God for all of his blessings. Humble prayer, right? But his pastor looks at him and says, Scott, are you kidding me? Scott, your father is none other than the God of the universe, your heavenly father, and you mean to tell me you don't have something you want to ask him? I mean, Scott, if this were your kids, 
and your kids came to you and you knew they were in great need, would you want them saying, hey, Dad, thanks for the blessings? Or would you want your kids to say, Dad, I need you. I need your strength. I need your comfort. I need your help. Scott, if your kids were in your position, how would you want them to speak to you? And then Scott had a flashback. And he remembered the day he was in tears. And his mom took him in his arms, in her arms. And she said, Scott, I love you. And I believe in you. And Scott Hamilton writes that in that moment, he felt God, his heavenly father, put his arms around him and say, Scott, I love you too. And Scott, I believe in you. And I have even greater plans for your life. If Scott or Hamilton were here today, he would tell you that encounter forever changed the way he saw God, and it happened through his mother's love. Today, Scott Hamilton is the founder and director for an organization known as CARES, and what the people of CARES do is that they come along beside people who have cancer and they speak into their future and they speak encouragement and hope and support and most of all they speak love and all of that happened because Scott's mother was able to demonstrate the love of God in these words I love you and I believe in you and that opened the door for God to be able to speak that truth into Scott's future where God gave him a hope and a vision and a plan greater than Scott's skating career could have ever been. On November the 12th, 2014, my mom passed away. It was one week away from her 50th wedding anniversary. And if I were to share with you anything about my mom, it would be that if I learned anything about who God is, it first came through my mother's love. You see, my mother, she taught me this about the gospel of God's grace. That God loved, that God gave, but ultimately the question I want to ask you today is this, do you believe? You see, we've been in this series called Grace Alone, and we've been talking about the fact that God fiercely loves you, that because he loves you, your sin does not change your value. And because sin does not change your value, your heavenly father is determined to save you. And how does he respond to your sin? With an inexhaustible ability to forgive and to bless and to redeem. And you don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. And like your mom, you don't have to prove yourself worthy of it. God does it because God loves you because that's who God is. And the question I'm asking you here today is the lesson my mom taught me. God loves, God gives. Do you, do you believe? Because if you do, you truly will receive.